Hi, good morning, everybody. My name is Eduard Ramon, and I'm a PhD student here in the UPC, and I'm working on 3D reconstruction. And at the same time, I'm working in Chrysalix Labs as a computer vision developer. And uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about 3D reconstruction, with each, uh, which is my, my topic. So we'll go uh, through a brief introduction and motivation. And then I will explain you a bit how classic methods approach the problem and which are the, the limitations of, of these approaches. And then we will talk about how deep learning can uh, help to improve the, the results obtained by the, by the classical methods. OK, so basically the, the principal goal is to obtain a, a surface uh, through a set of views. And uh, we can also uh, uh, recover other information like poses, albedo, but in this talk, we will focus on just surfaces, OK? Uh, it's very important because from images, we cannot see what's, what is inside the objects. We can just see the surface, right? So we will focus on, on that. And yeah, and uh, sometimes it's a bit confusing uh, why uh, do we want 3D reconstruction, but actually it's very useful. Uh, Javier already said some examples. For, for example, imagine a, a robot. If it wants to grasp, uh, grasp an, an object, needs to more or less uh, know how is the shape of that object. Or even if he wants to navigate through any environment, needs to know how the environment looks like. And yeah, so autonomous, autonomous driving will also benefit from that. Mm, 3D printing as well. So many, many applications. OK, so here's the classical pipeline based on geometry. And I will go very fast uh, through it. But first, we need to detect uh, some features on different images. And then uh, we extract some descriptors on those images and match them in a robust way. For example, using Ramsack or kind of similar uh, robust matching uh, algorithm. With these robust correspondences, we can triangulate them and know where the points are in, in 3D. And then after we have the triangulation, we need to refine all this in because this is just an approximation. And there is this uh, algorithm, which is a nonlinear optimization. It's called bundle adjustment. And with bundle adjustment, we refine the 3D positions at the same time that we refine the poses. Okay? And we end up with something, something like that, which is a point cloud, uh, what Javi explained. And it but is a sparse uh, point cloud. So then if we uh, want to have a more accurate shape, ac accurate shape uh, of the multi-view geometry output. What we do is to use multi-view stereo. And the first step is uh, point cloud densification. So at the end, what we do here is, if we have a set of images and sparse correspondences, what we do is to find dense correspondences in images and then triangulate. So we already have uh, dense 3D points. OK, the next step is meshing, is going from point cloud to mesh. Uh, that Javier already explained. And it's just finding the triangulations between points, let's say, to define the surface. And finally, texturing. Uh, normally, it's more for visualization purposes. But also, if you want to analyze the, the data, it's much better if you have a dense representation of color instead of per, uh, per uh, vertex color. So it's an important step. OK, so situations uh, when this kind of reconstruction algorithms can fail. So imagine we have uh, a few uh, number of images, or these images do not overlap sufficiently. So we will end up with uh, different 3D reconstructions, but it will not look like a whole object. Uh, also, if we have uh, like reflecting surfaces, uh, we will have another problem, which is that we cannot extract points. So we cannot triangulate, so we don't have 3D. Pure rotations, if you have a camera that is always at the same point, you cannot triangulate because you need two positions to triangulate a point. So if we are only, uh, if we are only rotating, we cannot triangulate anything. Repeated structures, if we need to compute matches and we have a structure, and a structure that looks like two different structures, which should I match? Uh, maybe I'm confusing the match because uh, of this similarity. Yeah, and then thin structures are also a problem. And non Lambertian surfaces, it's also an assumption we do uh, from <coughs> objects. This means that an object looks more or less like the same uh, independently 
of the point of view you are looking at that object. So this is uh, an assumption that we do, but sometimes it's not uh, fulfilled. So it's another problem. Okay, so with, with deep learning, one of the things we can help is with the descriptor. So uh, we have convolutional neural networks that are extracting uh, very powerful representations of the images. So with better descriptors, we could have better matchings, we could, we could have better 3D. And then, since we have seen many of scenes, we have some prior knowledge encoded on our system. So this can also help to reconstruct from a fewer number of images. Okay, so very simply, the, the problem is to estimate the function f. So from a set of images, we would like to map to a surface. So it's important, uh, the notion of surface, because uh, we are not working on plane anymore. And a surface is like a, you can imagine it as a plane with curvature, a curvature di uh, different than zero. And when we curve the, a plane, there are like stretchings and dilations. And this makes that the space is non-Euclidean anymore. So convolutions do not work well. That's why I uh, have explained this of graphs, which is a generalization of convolutions and works better in, this, in these cases. Yeah, and this is just a, a sentence uh, explaining what I, what I said. Okay, so here comes the first method. Um, so since uh, surfaces are non-Euclidean domains uh, and we like how uh, convolutions work, we, we want to work with them. So one trick is voxelization. So instead of working on the surface, we work on a 3D volume and we are just applying 3D convolutions, like the standard ones but in 3D. So this is the first method and here the structure is very simple. We have an encoder for an image like BGG, something like that. In the middle, we have a recurrent model that I will explain in the next slide. And then we have a decoder. So here, what we have is we are feeding a set of images. The recurrent model is accumulating like the descriptor, or the knowledge that the encoder extracts. And at the end, we can reconstruct. So if you see uh, with just the first view, the network doesn't know what this object is because he hasn't seen how it's uh, from other profiles. But with the next images, he can figure out it is a uh, it is a chair. Okay, the loss that they use in this uh, case is voxel-wise cross entropy. Like for classification, we would do uh, cross entropy. So here's voxel-wise. So we want to decide if each pixel is filled or not filled. It's just the only thing. It's bo each voxel, sorry. And okay, we go uh, to explain a bit more in detail this this module. So just uh, a brief, uh, remember of how a uh, uh, long shorter memory works because it's based, it, it is based on that and also on uh, gated recurrent units, but just uh, to explain LSTM be because it's simpler. So we are accumulating knowledge on this S signal, which is the state, okay? And at each iteration, we want to write, uh, to erase information that is not useful anymore and we, will and we want to write new information from the new input, okay? So this is uh, done by this gate here, this sigma, this is the uh, forget gate, and we have then this one, which is the input gate. So we have need information, new information to us all the time. And this is what appears in the paper, okay? So I'm gonna explain this. So instead of working with just one LSTM, what we do is that we arrange N LSTMs in a 3D grid, okay? So each of the little cubes here is an LSTM. And what, what we do with that is that we restrict the connectivity between the hidden states of the LSTM, so we model information locally. We cannot uh, know the hidden state of the uh, of cubes that are very far from me. So I want to model information locally. That, that's where convolutions work very well. And if you uh, take this scheme and rotate it 90 degrees, is exactly that. But the input, which is the only difference, this input layer is a 3D convolution, which is only looking at neighbor states, okay? That's the only difference. So they work also with Gru, uh, I also mentioned. Okay, and here they, they did an experiment. They want to see how uh, this method compares to uh, classical methods when the texture is reduced. If you see the car, the first one has a higher texture and this one has a uh, very low texture. So they saw that uh, when the texture details, are, uh, texture details are high, 
the uh, reconstruction the reconstruction is better with uh, multi view stereo but then uh, when the texture is low uh, the method uh, they propose outperforms the the classic ones and this with respect to the number of images uh, we can see that the, the classic method the multi view stereo uh, doesn't uh, do a good reconstruction until they have like 20 uh, views but the method they propose with just one view they are already able to reconstruct something and here we can see some examples these 20 30 and 40 views this is the method they propose for a, uh, for a plane for example and is the reconstruction of the classic the classic method so limitations uh, working with uh, 3d volumes it's inefficient to model surfaces, right? Because we are just we just want to model a plane which is stretching or is uh, curving, but we don't want to model the whole space. We don't mind if inside the object is filled or is not filled. We just want the surface, right? Then limit resolution. Uh, there are very uh, memory limitations with that because instead of growing um, uh, how say, to the square, it's growing cubically. So if we have more resolution, I have uh, to the uh, cube parameters uh, and memory that I need to uh, put in my GPU. Another thing that uh, they don't uh, mention, but when I was thinking I, I didn't like it, is that they model uh, sets, which are a group of images, as sequences. So in, in LSTM and GRUS, the ordering is important. And they are modeling this uh, set of images as uh, sequences, which I think is not uh, the best way. It requires 3D supervision, so if you don't have 3D, you cannot train this model. And also, it should require post-processing if you want to uh, maybe render it somewhere or print it. OK. This is another method, and the approach is completely different. They are going to model the surface as a set of points, a point cloud, let's say. And it's, it's already more efficient, because we are already modeling the surface. It's a bit complicated, because we have a sparse set of points, but they do it. This is the architecture. Uh, may look terrific, but it's actually very simple. What they do is to model the surface with two, two channels. The first one is the channel of the uh, pink squares, which are convolutions. And these uh, convolutions are arranged in a way which is the coder encoder. You, you can see, I, I mean encoder of the coder. So you, you see the first uh, row is an encoder, then I have a decoder, then another encoder, and then another, and then, yeah, there is the predictor already. And this is a whole class network, which is like a this structure of encoder decoders concatenated and with the skip connections. Okay? It's, different, it's similar to UNET, but instead of concatenations with uh, sums here of the, of the previous channels. And they do this for two reasons. First, they have this, this channel here, which is just a fully connected after the encoder, which is predicted points, but they realize that they cannot model like geometric structures that are, for example, planes or something that are very smooth. And with uh, convolutions, they can model all this because of this property of the locality of the, of the convolution. OK, so they also need to uh, work on which uh, losses or distances are suitable for point clouds for 3D reconstruction because it hasn't been studied uh, a lot. and they try these uh, two losses independently, first one, then the other one. The chamfer distance, which is if I'm in a point cloud, which is the closest point I have from the target point cloud. Okay, this is the chamfer loss. And then the earth mover distance is a bit more complicated, but it's just I need to uh, first estimate the vijection, which is um, a function that brings me from one set to the target set. And then I compute the distance from where I were to where I moved. And this is, the, this is the loss. And then they also want not to only uh, create very uh, accurate 3D reconstructions, but they also want to model the variability of the, uh, actually the uncertainty of when I give one image, what happens with what I'm not seeing? Because if I give just a frontal image, how is the part of the back? So they also want to model this as a generative model instead of just a predictor. And they need to define a loss which models that, which uh, they propose this one, which is just warping the loss that you are using with mean, minimum of n. That's, what's, that's what they propose, and it works quite well. 
And then they also model it with a variation, <coughs> conditional variational autoencoder that they will explain later. Okay, and, see, and here are some results comparing with the past method, which is this uh, column here. And this is what they obtain after processing, and this is the ground truth. As, as we can see, the, uh, they are keeping the structure a bit better, and we can also see it in, in the metrics here, which is outperforming the, the previous method. Some limitations still uh, is a bit better, but with lack of detail, we don't have very precise reconstruction. It's designed for single view. I think it's ex extendable to multiple views, but they design it for single view just. They also uh, say that there is a poor performance on unseen uh, categories. For example, if I train just for planes, if I give a table, it won't know how to, uh, to model it. And struggle, struggling with compositionality. If I have two chairs, even if I have trained for one chair, it will not be able to model two chairs. Okay? Yeah, and it requires post processing as well if we want to do something else with that. Okay, the last method uh, is based on what have explained of graph neural networks. And the important part is this baseline here. And what I'm doing is having an ellipsoid as a starting and at each layer, I'm deforming this ellipsoid in a course to find manner to, at the end, have the desired shape, okay? And there are two main important blocks here. One is the deformation block, which includes a uh, pooling uh, from this other uh, stream that I will explain now, and this graph and pooling, which is, uh, what it's doing is just to uh, refine the geometry here, okay? It's changing the topology of the graph, which is something which is a bit complex. Then, how do we deform this? We need some information from the image, right? Because uh, in this stream, we have nothing. So what they do is to create another stream, which is a simple encoder like BGG or the typical ones. And then what they do is to pull features from that network so they have information how the object looks like, OK? OK, so this is the deformation block. It has many things, but let's start with this one. This is the graph convolution. And the graph convolution is here. And this is the equation. If I have a vertex and I have a set of neighbors, I just multiply a weight that it will be learned by the network uh, for the position of my vector or, or my features in that vector. And then I also sum up my neighbors multiplied by another vector. There are many, there, there is a plenty of ways, as, as Javi said, to do a graph convolution. It is not maybe clear at all yet how to do it, but this is what they propose here. So with this, uh, this is like a convolutional layer, you can imagine. And if I stack some of them, so I have more computational pro, uh, power. And also to increase the receptive fields, I also uh, put skip connections. Okay, then how do I pull features? So to pull features, what I do is, Knowing the position of my vertex, I use the camera pose, which should be known in this case, to uh, project that vertex into the feature space. Okay? So imagine I have this 3D point, and I, project to, I can project to the image plane and then go to the feature space. And then I do what is called bilinear inter interpolation, because uh, when I project a point, I will not go to the pixel 2. I will go to pixel 2.5 in X and 2.7 in Y. So I need to interpolate between the neighbors to have a better estimation of how my, my feature is. OK. Here they also use the chamfer loss, which was introduced in the, in the other work. And they need other losses in order to uh, get stable shapes. Otherwise, the shape uh, looks very noisy. And they use this normal loss. For example, if we know how is, the, you know what is the normal? It's like. Uh, what is, uh, yeah, in a plane, the normal is like the perpendicular vector to that plane. So if I have a surface, it's the same, it's like the perpendicular vector. So they also um, super, supervise this. And then for regularization, they, they put this Laplacian loss, which is a measure of curvature of an object. And then the edge length. I don't want points that are going very far from my, from my object. Okay, and here we have a comparison with the first method, which is this column. The second method we explain, which is that column, after uh, meshing it, and then this one, which is the method we just explained. Don't look at this one. 
So again, uh, using graph neural networks and meshes, they obtain uh, better results than the previous methods that we presented before. Some limitations, still single view, but it could be extrapolated to uh, other views. Graph convolution is not based on geometric operator. This means that uh, a way to uh, work on graphs if, is to use a geometric operator like the Laplacian and then extract the eigenvalues and work with that. So I think it would give a much better representation of the object and they wouldn't need so many losses like the normal loss, the curvature loss, curvature loss and, and so on. And yeah, uh, it generates only meshes with genus uh, zero. Uh, I mean, this of genus zero is that uh, the mesh has no holes. So I cannot represent a donut with that. So it's like having a, a glove and the object inside and you explode the glove and it gets the shape. But you're gonna generate any, any other ways of, of objects. Okay, so this is all from my part. And thank you very much if you have any questions or